Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. My name is Robin Osborne, and I'm from Michigan State University, where it's now snowing and quite cold. And along with my colleagues, Anne Marie Nagel from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we are hoping that you will find this webinar very informative. Our municipal management series continues today, and we have the good fortune to have two experts with us today to discuss how Emerald Ashbor can be a financial headache for municipalities and the importance of planning to minimize its impact, maximizing value, calculating options to conserve your fiscal resources, and managing EAB impacts. Our presenters today are Richard Hauer from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point and Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University. Dr. Hauer is currently an associate professor of urban forestry, and he teaches courses in urban forestry, introductory forestry, nursery management and operations, woody plants, and dendrology. Rich has conducted research in tree biology, urban forest management, trees and construction, as well as ice storms and trees for more than 20 years. Cliff Sadoff is a professor of entomology at Purdue University and has been involved with research on emerald ash borer since its discovery in Indiana in 2003. Dr. Sadoff has conducted numerous talks on emerald ash borer, and you may remember him if you have been on any of our other emerald ash borer university webinars as a presenter for other talks on EAB. Wanted to let you know if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to write them in the chat pod. We will be responding to the questions after the webinar presentation is over to keep the flow of the presentation going. Uh, please stay tuned to the end because we would like your feedback and we'll be providing a link to a survey that we'd like you to participate in. The first 10 people to participate will receive an EAB goodie bag. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing this week Wednesday. To go, if you'd like to watch this webinar, go to www.emeraldashbor.info to access that recording, as well as the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars. And please give us feedback about you. We always want to know how we can make these webinars better. Thank you for attending today. And with that, welcome, Rich, and let's begin. of a pioneer on thinking about some of the cost aspects of uh, urban forest management. So um, I'm uh, trying to find my talk here and uh, while that's getting loaded up, um, this is uh, one of those neat things. Um, I got a message that you can't hear me that well. Uh, can you hear me better, Greg? A bit better. Can you hear me better now? Okay, great. Um, and uh, anyways, um, this has uh, been something that I could think back to as uh, from my childhood days of Dutch album disease, which is something I actually contrast with, uh, the presentation here today. And um, having difficulties actually, Robin, uh, getting my talk up. Okay. Um, you're looking for the one that we loaded yesterday. Okay, hold on, I can do that. Okay, thank you. All right. How's that? Thank you very much, Robin. No problem. It's a good thing to have. <laughs> Richard, I think we've lost you. Lost your audio here. Um, could you check your? Could you check your speaker or your uh, mic? It's like you turned off, kind of like your speaker, or like your mic is turned off. 
professionals like there we go there we go all right now can you hear me great very well yes thank you cliff thank you tom all right um and so I, i've got involved with this a, a couple years ago and uh i'm also having problems advancing here we go and so the first thing I always like to think about is if you look at an uh, urban forest or anything for that matter, you have to ask the question, does it have benefits? Does it have value? And uh, you can look at it maybe socially uh, on a street here, a street from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, where they had to remove some uh, infested ash trees. And obviously that's an unfortunate aspect of uh, emerald ash borer management. But if you think about any town um, and if you're planning for emerald ash borer, do you want to... Um, Think about the value you have. And Cliff's going to contrast the cost side. I'll, I'll look at cost, but also uh, bring into the horizon here the benefits of the urban forest. And so if you look at the urban forest, uh, certainly we have great data. Say, um, you know, it, it provides green infrastructure. It provides value to the landscapes. And there's statistics anywhere from 0% at the very low end, and that's an anomaly of one interesting study from Urbana, Illinois, to uh, depending on the context that trees can provide maybe up to close to 40% of the value in an undeveloped lot of the actual value of that property. The other aspect, um, we have uh, you know, a lot of cool, neat uh, ecological services that in the last 20 years have become uh, much more easy to uh, bring into the equation here. Energy savings, for example, and the strategic placement of vegetation. Um, saving the cost of uh, burning fossil fuels to cool a house or heated for that matter, uh, holding back rainwater in a storm uh, setting, or uh, maybe uh, bringing up carbon in uh, the tree population. Some of the more recent things, um, business activity for example, where we can look at the urban forest providing value um, in uh, businesses in a more greened environment will have more customers that stay longer and actually spend more money. And if you're trying to stay in business, those are three important recipes for success where I can have more people spend uh, more money and stay longer. More recently is a, an interesting uh, aspect of human health. In the last couple decades also, there have been a lot of fantastic research that are in publications that most of us don't read, like uh, American Journal for Preventative uh, Health, where, um, for example, a more recent aspect uh, of this, a paper by Jeff Donovan, uh, it, it was uh, released here a couple weeks ago that looked at the relationship between trees and human health. And here's what's kind of neat about this paper. They, uh, well, actually, you could say maybe uh, unfortunate about the outcome of this paper, where you have um, lower respiratory tract diseases and cardiovascular-related mortality. You ended up having people that died sooner than they normally would. And so if you look at these arrows, the years of infestation, as the years of infestation since emerald ash borer was identified, um, the incidence of death from these two aspects of people with uh, lower respiratory uh, tract diseases and cardiovascular uh, issues, uh, people died sooner than they normally would in areas that emerald ash borer was not present. Now, um, you know, in that paper, they have some some interesting information to say. Well, they controlled it pretty well. Um, whether this is actually a causation effect or, or a correlation definitely is the matter. We have some you know, evidence of the importance of, of the urban forest just on the human health of populations. You can actually go back uh, 150 years or so, and people like Frederick Law Olmsted would refer to the urban forest as the lungs of the city. And so from that aspect, um, uh, the urban forest is really important. The first thing I also look at when I think of emerald ash borer management is what do you have for trees? You know, you could think back to, uh, you know, the TV show MASH, where uh, probably the aspect of triage was popularized in the population of people, where uh, if you, you have people, you take care of the worst first um, for medical treatment. Um, you could also think of emerald ash borer and ash trees. A tree like this green ash on our campus with brown rot, you certainly would not uh, um, probably want to keep around because this tree has been shedding branches for the last couple of years. And so I take care of the worst first and certainly remove the tree. I wouldn't even think about worrying about emerald ash borer. I'd think about human safety in this particular case. Now, I've been in uh, uh, a lot of different states where I've uh, presented about emerald ash borer uh, economics and management, and I always like to put together some statistics. And so I'm not going to read over every one of these states, but the bottom line is if you look at uh, Iowa to uh, Wisconsin, um, is it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, the low billions of dollars per state. And it depends on whose estimate approach you use. They all 
say a similar message. This is a billion dollar problem and then some for any state um, facing a emerald ash borer. We could take one uh, city in particular. Now we could do this for actually a lot of communities. I just pick on Milwaukee because uh, they're near home here and we also have a um, urban forest ecosystem analysis that was done that basically said uh, citywide there's uh, over a half million ash trees. Okay, almost uh, one per person in that particular state or that uh, city and in particular that's uh, nearly 20 percent of the tree population. And so you can look at the actual benefits or, uh, of that urban tree population. You can look at the cost to actually uh, remove those trees. Bottom line, the impact of just the street trees in Milwaukee, they're facing in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, and if you look at the entire urban forest population based on uh, David Sidner's work from Ohio, they're looking in the hundreds of millions of dollars, the impact of EAB uh, just on that city alone. So what are some of the outcomes of emerald ash borer uh, management alternatives? You can look at this picture in Illinois. Now I think you'd find hard pressed for anyone to say that this is not a highly desirable view. Just aesthetics or ecologically the services that these uh, ash trees provide. On the other hand, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find much of the population to say alternative from Toledo, Ohio would be the outcome that most people would uh, desire. Now, unfortunately, uh, uh, Toledo um, had emerald ash borer that uh, advanced very quickly. And, and uh, you know, no town would wish to have that upon them. And, and uh, if you heard from Chad Tinkle speak, he would talk about the management issues that he's had to uh, work with. The bottom line is you can look at the image on the right and say, well, now is this a picture that uh, aesthetically uh, people would prefer to that in Illinois or that in Ohio? And, you know, there's ample evidence to say, yeah, the, the picture, the street tree setting in Illinois would be much higher rated and of a social prefer uh, preference. Now, I always like to say uh, there's a lot of things that we can be told what to do. One thing I could say, well, just do nothing. Emerald ash borer is going to happen. And I know that's one approach that, you know, we're going to contrast here today. Another approach is, um, you know, emerald ash borer is going to come, so why not just remove all your ash uh, after death, okay, and just uh, let it take its course. The other aspect is maybe you prepare ahead of time and uh, say over a five-year time period, uh, let's just get rid of the ash tree population. They're going to die anyways, and uh, that could be a management alternative, and that's one that we'll uh, actually contrast today. Another aspect, maybe a little more modern than that, and it gets back to tree risk management, structural removal, where we'd actually look at and assess the tree, does it make sense to actually even retain that tree given uh, its structural condition? Chemically treat, you know, that's another management alternative that we'll contrast here today, along with uh, maybe we just wish for the best and hope the problem doesn't hit our town. And, uh, and, and maybe it's 20 years before uh, the wishing for the best actually um, comes to fruition and, and emerald ash borer is in your town. The other aspect is, uh, I remember a nursery friend of mine once said uh, a few years ago when he visited his nursery, was, uh, well, we're recommending planting ash because they're cheap right now. They were trying to sell um, large caliper ash trees for $50. The next year we came back to the nursery I, and I asked them uh, how many they had sold. And uh, that was when I was looking over the chip pile where they had just removed all the ash that apparently they had not sold. So obviously that's uh, not a desirable outcome from them. Okay, I'm going to contrast, uh, you know, in an urban forest not so long ago. When I say that, I could think of my lifespan. In 1975, I'm going to T-Ball, and I, I hear a chainsaw fired up. It was the first elm being removed in the town I was living in at that time. These happen to be images from Minneapolis. Now, it could be green ash today or American elm 30 years ago. Bottom line is the picturesque uh, um, element of the neighborhood is gone, along with uh, any value that those trees were provided. Along with, the, if you just want to look at the cost side, which Cliff is going to contrast today, um, the aspect there. Now we can look at uh, um, history. Now I remember being told years ago as a young lad that failure to learn from history, you're likely to repeat mistakes. Well, I'm a kind of a, a buff for history, especially when it comes to the urban forest. Um, I, I love reading old publications, and there's always a lot of neat things you can learn from them. One is this neat publication that uh, was developed in the 1970s, actually in the state of Minnesota. And what I really want to highlight is this main uh, theme of the title, by ensuring an orderly transformation. What this publication basically said, and it was a recommendation to the state legislature that said, if you do something and you follow our, our suggested approach that's based on science, the outcome is going to be more favorable. Now it's going to cost money, um, and, and we'd rather not have to invest any money. Bottom line though is, uh, burying your head in the sand and, and wishing for the problem to go away 
uh, uh, based on the recommendations in this report was the worst outcome. Now they had some science at that time to basically say that since the years of outbreak, okay, that if you did nothing, no control, within a short period of time, a little over a decade, all the elms be gone. Now we're going to contrast that with ash here today. Now if you had various levels of sanitation, best, good, or fair, you'd have more trees uh, left. There's a cost associated with those sanitation. But from that era, what we learned was, was sanitation actually was economically a more favorable um, event than no sanitation. And um, this image from uh, Dr. Herms shows us very well. The interesting thing is if you take that image of DED in the, the bottom right and contrast that uh, with the, the simulation of, of trees dying in the plots that they measured in, in uh, Michigan, is you get in a period of uh, about a decade plus, most of the ash trees will be gone if you do nothing. So I find it kind of interesting actually two different uh, pest problems. You have a kind of similar uh, issue with mortality. Now bottom line is a good friend of mine, Mark Stennis, once said, uh, whether you like it or not, Dutch elm disease is going to cost you money. All we have to do is take Mark's phrase and take DED out and put EAB. And there's a lot of truth to that. And so the bottom line is it's going to cost money. And uh, one thing with this slide that you're actually not seeing is there's this nice population in Minneapolis. Okay? So just in the snowstorm, we're actually having a lot of drifting here in point today. So that's why my image apparently is not showing. But if you look uh, here, is the debris pulse. As you'd see a peak in, in uh, a tree's dying in Minneapolis if they would not have done anything. And probably one of the most difficult challenges any manager faces is hiring a lot of people at one time um, or perhaps uh, dealing with uh, a lot of customers that actually come at your uh, business at um, you know an hour that you didn't expect them because that cause, causes chaos. The same thing in the urban forest. If you have a lot of trees that die in a short period of time, do you have the resources available to uh, manage those? Do you have the resources available to just actually tackle the cost or alone the debris. Now we have good models actually from very tragic events. This is one from actually uh, back at my birth state, Minnesota. St. Peter, Minnesota had a, a very uh, extreme tornado that came through that destroyed much of the urban forest in parts of the town. Now did they recover? Actually they did. Um, they took care of the debris. It perhaps took a couple months. They planted a lot of trees because of an angel donor and they did recover. Okay, would they rather not have had the tornado? No doubt about it. Now we have models to handle debris and actually big equipment, a lot of resources, we can we can handle debris. That's not an, an issue there. It's always do we have the resources and uh, mobilization of forces to make that happen. We have great models on uh, storm preparedness that actually we can use uh, to our advantage actually in emerald ash borer planning. Okay, so we have urban forest management models out there, whether it's from Dutch elm disease or storms that have been developed over the last 40 years. And so this part of the equation, I actually think we're really well set up. And in fact, in the last 10 years, I like to say uh, we probably learned more about emerald ash borer than, uh, we, than it took us in about a 40-year time period from the 1930s to the 1970s uh, with Dutch elm disease. So we're really fortunate from that aspect, the science that's been in play. All right, so we're going to get soon into uh, some of the research we did at uh, our school here. But if you ask about emerald ash borer, you first have to ask questions. Maybe one is, I want to know what the cost to remove dead trees only. And so I'm going to contrast that along with uh, Cliff uh, talking about that aspect here today. Maybe your question is, what's the value of lost benefits? Maybe you have a, an aspect of what's going to be the cost to reforest the urban forest. What's the highest urban forest value? Maybe that's a management goal. Okay. Maybe your goal is uh, to manage the greatest number of trees remaining over a period of time. Okay, so we, we tackled all these questions actually um, as an aspect of getting uh, uh, started with our research. And um, we've been uh, fortunate to have some papers published on the matter. One, economic analysis of emerald ash borer management options. That's behind a paywall. If you'd like a copy, uh, just email me, uh, rhaueer at uwsp.edu, and I can get you a copy. Otherwise, uh, these other ones, Arborist News and Tree Care Industry, I can also send you if you desire. Okay, we had an objective to our study. The initial one was, I just needed an inventory of our campus. I teach an urban forest management class. I need a tree population for my students. And so that was the initial aspect. But I told uh, the students that were working for me at the time, wouldn't it be neat to do a little student undergrad research project? I said it'd take a day. 
and you can actually look at uh, the ecological value of our urban forest. I knew people would be interested with that. I said it would only take a day. And then I kind of conned them into actually uh, another day's worth of work, which actually took a couple months. And about three years later, we're here today actually talking about some of this research. But one aspect was do nothing, okay? And we wanted to contrast that. What would be the economic impacts of that decision versus treating trees, versus removing all trees within five years, versus removing uh, um, the, uh, the non-ash, or removing the ash trees and replacing with non-ash. Then uh, about a year thereafter, we actually added another alternative uh, to contrast what if emerald ash borer didn't occur, what are the values of the urban forest population. And so another aspect is uh, when I uh, do modeling, I like to see if I can break the model. So I like to use a lot of different approaches. And so we used a couple of evaluation approaches. One, CTLA, stands for Council of Tree Landscape Appraisers. It's been a system that's been in development for about 100 years. And uh, that aspect is um, it's a pretty well... A developed system that is, is one approach to come up with tree evaluation. And another one is iTree. So we use both of those as evaluation methods. We also looked at, you know, the population, the value of the retained trees and the value of the lost trees. And I use the context here, net value. That's actually where you have the value of the population, which is derived from all the, the cost involved with that, that tree population minus all the um, uh, the benefit of the population minus all the expenses associated with managing that tree population. Bottom line is one of our initial goals or objectives was to uh, say how can uh, managers make effective decisions based on their own goals and objectives. Now I'm not going to tell anyone how to um, you know best manage their urban forest. That's certainly based on what is best for their community or their goals or objectives. All I can do is, is develop a system that allows you to answer questions you have. And so Again, the CTLA is, is actually a compensatory value. That's actually the, the value to replace uh, that population or a tree. I-tree is a functional value, which looks at the benefits of that tree population. So again, two different ways we contrasted. Now one aspect is, is ash or maple or elm, they die every day. Okay? Now a, a tree itself may take a century before it dies. It may die at a seedling stage. But the bottom line is, is you have to know something about the mortality normally of an ash population. That was something that we built into the models here. It varies obviously with the age of the trees. As trees get older, they uh, will be more susceptible to death than uh, trees at a, a middle age uh, cohort. It certainly depends on the site conditions, depends on the condition of the tree itself. And uh, you know, a modeler could uh, put a normal mortality at 2 to 4 percent for urban trees. We used actually 2 percent for our ash population. Talking with Cliff the other day, he actually models at 2 percent also. And that's based on historical data, actually, from our campus population and work they've done in Milwaukee. And so when we modeled our ash tree population, okay, it ended up um, looking very much like uh, the outcome with, with Herms here. Again, we're having the big snowstorm here in Point, a lot of drifting, uh, so we got whiteout conditions. Um, what this graph actually shows that if you remove all your trees within five years, you have no ash. Um, if you do nothing, it will follow the sequence that Dan Herms has actually here. And if you actually do some management alternatives, such as remove trees and replace them, or chemically treat them, or don't have EAB, over a period of about 20 years, you still have a, a really acceptable level of tree uh, population left. And so within our models, uh, here's the math that can make you maybe go horizontal. The bottom line is it's a, just a summation model. And we have here the the value of trees, okay, for the tree retained value model, it's a function of all the costs that you subtract from that value. And so I have a value of trees, okay, my net benefit here is a function of all the costs that I subtract. If I'm looking at lost tree value, I'm looking at the value of that tree, plus all the costs that I spend on either maintenance or treatment or removal or planting which is a function of, of lost tree value. Now this is a, an approach that's been used for uh, many, many uh, years in other different uh, applications. So we embedded this in uh, this emerald ash borer planting simulator that uh, came out about one year ago. And uh, we're just in the process of uh, updating this to perhaps call it version 1. From the math perspective, we haven't found any issues, nor has anyone reported that. Um, some of the things are going to be 
designed to just change on kind of some of the variables that we may input or the outcome of the models and I'll, I'll get to that. Bottom line is if you had to cut to the chase you need to know how many trees you have, okay what's your population of ash, what's their mean size and diameter, okay if you want to contrast a uh, preemptive removal, how many years are you going to take to remove all your trees? And the assumption here is if you say five years, one-fifth of your population is removed every year. Tree growth rate is important to know. In our area, between 0.5 and 0.4 and 0.5 would be the annual increment growth in inches per year. In Chicago, it may be uh, in the mid-0.5 range. Um, as you go further south, you've got a longer growing season. The tree grow growth rate uh, will change. Um, these maintenance and removal costs, okay, these are based on some numbers from uh, work done by Greg McPherson. We're in the process of actually updating these to get more, uh, a bigger data set along with uh, more recent um, data. This is data, though, I did actually um, discount to the present time frame, 2012. One thing that, and you could actually leave uh, growth rate, maintenance, removal costs default, and it's really not going to change much of an outcome of, of the end um, uh, information or decisions that you'll make. What you really need to uh, consider though is treatment costs. And so for example, um, whatever chemical you use, what's the cost on a diameter inch basis? Okay. And what's the uh, increment interval for treatment? Okay. So if you're using a chemical that needs to be applied annually, you'd have this set at one. If you are applying it uh, every um, other year, you'd set it at two. Based on the chemical, what's the published success rate? Okay, and so for amamectin benzoate, uh, it's been found to be about 99% effective uh, using a two-year uh, treatment interval. We set the natural survival actually at 98%, and uh, that's something you could change. This part right here is not changed by the user; it's actually the control survival. Um, to actually get at your your valuation, this is from CTLA. Um, use what's the cost for whatever inch size tree you're using to replace? What's the replacement cost for that? what's the installation, comes up with a unit tree cost and uh, these are, again would be ideal to, to change for your local situation but if you left these at default it probably won't change much of your income based on work I've done with this model trying to break it. Alright so the bottom line as I said you need to know the number of ash you have, the mean population and if you want to contrast you know, a treatment uh, um, aspect you need to have the treatment cost on a diameter inch basis, your treatment interval and your treatment success. Which I think we lost you one more time here. We lost your audio. <laughs> we still don't have it. I see your audio, but you sh I can't hear you yet. Still don't have it. still don't have it. Even though I see your audio, I'm just not hearing you. Now try. I can hear you, I think. There you go. Oh, we had you. Now I don't have you. Can you hear me yet? Not yet. We got you. No, we got you. You're there. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Oh, you had it. We had it. You had it. Try it again. We had you there for a second. I can't see you now. You're not there. Can you try one more time? 
to, to uh, get back on. <laughs> One more time. Let's try, Richard. Still can't, we still aren't hearing you. You were there and then you were gone. <clears throat> yeah, we still, um, I'm not sure what it is. If you can, if, when you can see your little microphone up here by your name, then it's more, absolutely more chance that we can hear you, but we're not seeing you right now. Make sure your microphone is on. Well, folks, hang on. We're going to try to get Rich back on. All right, folks, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, technical difficulties apparently with the snow today. So, all right. Um, I thank you, Cliff, for saying you can hear me fine. Here's what we found out in our population. If we look at um, the treatment, we ended up finding uh, treatment actually was the most desirable. If you look at urban forests have values. So the met, mean net value on a tree population was, was uh, more desirable than if you just look at uh, allowing ash trees to die and take care of them after they die. And so that aspect uh, was second in line. The worst case scenario is actually if we just decided to uh, let's get rid of all our ash in five years. Um, over a 20-year time horizon, we only have had $124,000 of, of net value. Again, that's benefits minus costs. Um, compared to having no EAB, obviously that's the most uh, desirable alternative. Now, the benefit cost was something we uh, added based on some reviewer comments um, for a paper when we initially submitted it. And so that was actually, I'm, I'm kind of happy. I was resistant at first, but 
from an economic perspective, it's something that's highly desirable. Benefit cost, if you're unfamiliar with it, for every dollar I invest, okay, if I have a number greater than one, that means I get a greater return on my investment. Okay, now as an economist, would I be really enamored with 1.08? Well, I'm better than than having 0.35, which basically says for every dollar I invest, I'm uh, it's cost me three bucks. Um, and then contrast that with no EAB. The neat thing about putting this thing into our model was it gives me also some approximation from the literature. I know from uh, studies that that uh, benefit cost ratios of the urban forest. Um, are anywhere from uh, 1 to 3.5 and so that gives us another magnitude of confidence. So this benefit cost is an important thing to actually look at. All right and so here's the part where I think it's sometimes too much information that we may actually be uh, removing some of these in our, our uh, version 1. Bottom line is uh, green is better than red. Obviously where is it red for treatment? the cost for treating your population on our campus, it costs us uh, about $8,000 annually if we're going to treat ash trees. Uh, take home message there is if I can actually attract one out of state student, I can actually pay for emerald ash borer treatment. So if you put it in contest texts like that of if I have to get another business to actually pay for the urban forest or uh, some other aspect um, um, helps from decision making. I'm going to contrast a few things and then turn it over to Cliff. Um, in Milwaukee, uh, they're actually treating a lot of ash trees uh, and they're doing it in-house, um, it costs them $3.75. That's based on labor cost and chemical cost. And using a 2x rate for emmectin benzoate, that's what they've decided to use so far. Actually their benefit costs uh, are 1.37. They have 16 inch average ash trees and they have a little over 30,000 that they're managing. Um, compared to having no EAB with that population, they have a, a 2 to 1 benefit cost ratio. And so treatment again actually was economically um, justifiable based on uh, uh, b uh, discounted mean net value or benefit cost ratios. Obviously they have to have a half million dollars annually uh, in their budget to take care of this. The bottom line is if they're managing for the net value of their urban forest, that's a, an investment that makes sense. Now you could contrast a couple different chemicals, uh, metoclopred versus emmectin. And uh, bottom line is two different approaches. Um, you spend less money on annually on uh, imidacloprid, but you also have about a half million dollars less net value after 20 years. And so it's a horse apiece on which decision you make. What would end up though is over time though, you actually do have fewer uh, ash trees. And so earlier when I was talking about uh, preemptive removal or doing nothing or treatment, which is the orange line here, um, using the, the imidacloprid, you're going to have fewer trees left after 20 years than if you use the emmectin. And then uh, on the home stretch here, uh, some recent work from uh, Deb McCulloch where they looked at treatment versus no treatment with uh, ash trees. And bottom line is this is that same mortality uh, uh, graph that we've seen uh, several times here today along with if you actually do have treatment. A neat thing out of that study though was if you compare treatment versus no treatment was what if you actually only treat a portion of your population? And what they found was if they treated 20% annually versus 10% versus no treatment, 20% was a sweet spot. And so with uh, the chemical they used, emmectin, if they only treat half of the, or 20% of what they normally treat uh, every year, um, they had as, uh, as much control as if they did 30 or 40 or treating all the ashes that they, they would need to for that chemical success. So that's a really interesting finding, which what it does bottom line is it actually ends up reducing the potential cost. So if that science pans out, the neat thing is rather than spending um, um, $11.3 million over a 20 year time horizon, okay, for treating uh, half your trees annually with emmectin, okay, you could end up spending uh, with just 20% of the trees treated um, $4.6 million. And so obviously it's a cost saving if uh, that science again pans out. So bottom line is, is if you do nothing, you'll get this big pulse of money or debris that you have to deal with. And that, you know, is one decision a person could make, but this is based on the science that we know with this insect and its effects on an ash tree population. This is an outcome that's going to occur. Okay, so this debris pulse or cost pulse. All right, well, I thank you for staying patient with me as uh, 
we had some technical difficulty here today. I'm going to turn it over to Cliff. Uh, he's going to go for about 15 minutes. We're going to have time for questions. I can stay along as, around as long as we need for any questions you may have later. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, hello, you can hear me now? Yeah, can you put your mic a little closer to your mouth? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, just to uh, follow up on uh, Rich's setup over here, uh, you know, this is just an example that some of you who've been uh, long-time attendees of EAB University might remember from Chan Tinkles. Uh, 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 presentation. Uh, this is just a, a, another example of, 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 of the death curve uh, that, that Chad liked to talk about. Uh, it was first detected in uh, Fort Wayne in 2007. And in the first few years, uh, 2008 and 2009, they basically were able to keep up with removing trees as they died, but by 2010, uh, they jumped from losing 500 trees to 1,000 trees, and then from uh, in, in, in that year, then from in 2011, they jumped up to uh, 2000, and uh, it was uh, just just jumping uh, ex exponential. So, so uh, the the point of what I'm going to talk about is uh, how you could modulate or, or or reduce those annual costs so it doesn't bust your budget. Okay. And uh, it costs money at uh, Fort Wayne. Uh, uh, in October, was still trying to fight uh, to get the money to remove those 4,500 trees. Okay, as uh, Rich stated earlier, there are three uh, different types of products that are available. Uh, that are available uh, that, that that you can uh, find out about. Uh, you know, EABinviana.info. We have uh, some updated information about, about this sort of stuff. But these are the three products. The triage injection refers to the emamectin benzoate uh, product. So uh, here's another way of, 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 of looking at the invasion wave that Rich, Rich was talking about. Um, you know, uh, in, in Deb McCulloch's paper, uh, she talks about the uh, cusp, uh, the crest, and the post-crest period. Of, and you think of it like a wave. The first couple of years when emerald ash is around, uh, the population grows rapidly, rather slowly, and the damage also progresses slowly. But then as time, uh, after about uh, four... My speaking part. I was just giving a webinar earlier. Okay. After four, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Richard, I think you're still coming through. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. It looked like you had like 17, 18 trees in my bed. Yeah. You're, you're still coming through here. My, my, okay. Sorry. Yeah, because that's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's hard to hear. Okay. So anyway, so, um, uh, the gaps is just to uh, you know, introduce the concept that if you have a plantable space, <laughs> is when you do an inventory, that's a normal time. <laughs> Which you need to mic your, you need well, to, you know, yeah, the, the actual trees that you collect, I mean, we're going to use that information later in the semester. Um, no. Yeah, from the aspect that if vacancy is not there, the world's not going to end in there. So, you're okay there. Okay. Okay, great. You're welcome. All right. So, uh, just please mute your mic. Uh, you were coming over there. Um, okay. All right. Getting back to this, uh, the invasion wave. Okay, so uh, so we use a model in our emerald ash borer cost calculator where uh, we basically double the number of trees that are affected by emerald ash borer each year. So if you look at this model, the black line, uh, you go from one percent to two percent to four to eight to sixteen to, to thirty-two to sixty-four to a uh, hundred percent. Really quick. So in eight years, you lose all your trees. And and, and what we do is is arm that information. You know, we know that uh, the emerald ash borer population will, will dwindle soon thereafter. Uh, after this 12-year cycle occurs, uh, instead of having to be aggressive in your management efforts, you could be more into a maintenance mode. And the logic goes like this, is that after the only trees left standing are the ones that you put insecticide into, uh, those, those treated trees uh, should really drop that emerald ash borer population down very low. So you may be able to Kick back a hold back on your on your treatment, and we're assuming you probably would wind up having to spay maybe as 
to apply maybe as third as, as often. Uh, Lafayette, where we live in Indiana, we are we're just starting to get into it right now. Uh, we have, we're starting to see uh, things uh, at a low rate, but in Indianapolis and, and, and Chicago, uh, where, uh, where they're in the impressed the phase, uh, there's a lot of mortality occurring. So the ML asks for a cost calculator, um, uh, allows you to uh, compare lots of options. This, the new version uh, allows you to compare uh, replace uns, uh, this, this concept of replacing unsaved ash trees uh, versus uh, replacing all trees versus saving half. And that, that's the scenario I like to compare at this point. And we, we did this in a fictitious forest of 1,200 trees. This might be familiar to some of you. Uh, where we uh, just had uh, 1,200 trees uh, evenly distributed among uh, different age classes, uh, and we can compare replacing ash trees as they die versus replacing them over eight years versus saving the best half. And I think that you know this would be the kind of a situation where you know you're probably not going to be able to save all your ash trees due to structural considerations that Rich talked about, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, treatment assumptions would be an average of three dollars per inch per year. Whether that is due to uh, uh, treating every two or three years with, with, with the triage, or or uh, treating it with uh, one of the neonicotinoid pro pro products, uh, the result would be the same. But for the model purposes, we, we're talking about a yearly treatment, uh, three dollars per year, and then maintenance every three years thereafter, uh, assuming a ninety-five percent uh, saving uh, with, with the, the, the neonicotinoid pro products. An annual mortality rate of two percent. Otherwise, and what we see, okay, is uh, I guess the top of the slide is cut off a, a, a little bit, but uh, what we can see here is that on the top graph we have the annual costs of, uh, of each year over a 25-year period, and the black line refers to uh, the cost of replacing the trees as they die. Now, the first four years into the process. You know, you're looking very well. It looks like you're not really uh, uh, spending much money. But after year four, when you start getting the exponential death curve, we jump up to over $253,000 per year. Uh, that contrasts with a uh, proactive, re preemptive replacement uh, of all your ash trees uh, costing $90,000 a year versus saving half of your trees, which costs you about $70,000 a year. And uh, so right off the bat, you can see that saving half your trees or preemptive removal actually does tame costs a bit. And if you look at the costs over a 25-year period, which is the bottom part, where you just add the costs each year on top of each other, you can see that at the end of 25 years, all these costs, the cost of all three strategies, are within about $50,000 of each other, okay, for the most part. So uh, the long-term costs are, are, are about the same. Uh, in the next slide, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, uh, we had this uh, conference up in, in, in Hazeldale, and we had a politician uh, talk about this. He was a congress, he was a, an alderman, and he said the only number he cares about is number four. Okay, and in the four-year election cycle, if you were happen to be lucky enough, and you were, uh, 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 you know, in, in the year where, the, where, where there was a population that you could be apparently saving a lot of money, if you just let Emerald Ashford decide which tree were going to be removed, but uh, if you happen to come in later on, you would look a bit more like a dunce. Uh, because you would actually have broken your budget removing uh, ash trees. Now, um, the uh, annual cost comparison uh, in, in, in today's dollar, uh, you know, if, if, if you were to say reduce the cost even further uh, at a dollar twenty-five per inch per year, if you're doing this in-house, I think uh, the the, the uh, cost of treatment becomes even more favorable and might actually be a little bit lower than uh, what would be. Uh, it, it, uh, if you just replace all your trees in, in the 25-year uh, period. Well, to make a long story short, uh, what does this mean? This means that uh, all three strategies, even though they're costing about the same amount in the long run, they wind up providing different results. And this graph here uh, gives you a, just sort of a gestalt of, a, of an idea of what the relative benefits are. And this just simply means, ask the question, how big is, is the forest, is the ash forest going to be at the end of 25 years under each of these three different management scenarios? Replacing all the trees, whether by letting the emerald ash board uh, dictate which trees are being removed or whether you're doing it proactively, winds up with about half the size of the forest that you had had you saved half of your trees. So in other words, you get twice the amount of forest 
for the same amount of money if you are saving the best half of the trees that you have available. Uh, is earlier better than later? Uh, let's, and, and, and I think that uh, one of the things that happens is that uh, typically uh, uh, it's very hard to get support for starting a management pro a program because it does cost an awful lot of money. And often you have to wait till a few trees start looking bad or starting to die. And that typically happens uh, uh, when about 8% of the uh, trees are starting to uh, uh, are starting to be affected, showing some signs, uh, because um, and, and, and that and at that point in time you only have four years until all the trees are are gone. And uh, with a calculator we can just sort of simulate that by by choosing which year based on the number of trees that were uh, lost to date. And, and and what we see here is that the top part, the top graph shows what happens if you start at the first year of the infestation, and the bottom graph shows what happens if you started at year four. As, as, as expected, what you're doing is you're just compressing your control costs over a four-year period, four period instead of an eight-year period. So your peak costs of letting Emma Lashmore decide you know, call the shots uh, turns into, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a little bit more expensive, it's about $330,000, but uh, your uh, preemptive removal is uh, more than double, and same same goes for uh, your uh, uh, saving half half your trees. Interestingly, if you start a little bit later, your overall costs are going to be a little bit lower because you have fewer years of, of treating insecticides into into that that cycle. So the take home point is that insecticides can create a pre a protective bunker for the trees during the invasion wave, and that the cost of replacing ash trees as they die can be deceptively coupling at first, like as I mentioned, that four-year cycle of budget busting during the exponential death phase. Protecting half the trees will cost the same, but will provide much more benefits in the long run. And delaying the program causes higher short-term, uh, but costs but lower long-term costs. And um, and, I, I, and one of the things that you know I would suggest you might want to try is use the cost calculator to run some numbers so that you can actually uh, show some scenarios to get some uh, buy-in from the community as you're comparing specific uh, strategies. Now, uh, this urban slam uh, project uh, that you know that Rich talked about earlier, the, the Ben McCulloch's work, uh, we actually ran the urban slam model, uh, in, in, in where you treat only 40%. And, and, and the logic of that is that because the emerald ash borer has to fly for several weeks after it emerges from the tree uh, in order to feed and mature its eggs, if you have 40% of the trees in the area with poisonous leaves, the chances are they're going to be killed before they lay most of their eggs. And that 20% a year in, per year in Rich's simulation and in Deb's simulation uh, refers to treating a different 20% each year. And because these products last for two years, that's how you get 40% of your trees, of your foliage, uh, being uh, laced with insecticide. So what happens is that, uh, you know, you can see that the urban slam uh, on the annual basis is is far lower than proactive removal. And over a 25-year period at the bottom part of the graph, it's also far, far lower in 25-year in, in costs. So this new strategy has some real potential for just completely being a game changer over here. And the size of the remaining ash forest should be higher because the trees are still allowed to grow. So um, uh, with that, I think uh, I'm ready to uh, open up uh, more for questions for myself and Rich. Okay. So if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat pod and we can answer any questions you have. Um, Cliff has also given some information here that you can visit and um, get uh, more information on what's going on and as well as uh, folks to contact for resources. We've got about five more minutes, so feel free to to give us any input you need have. I see people are typing, so I think we're going to have questions here in a couple seconds. Oh, great question from uh, from David uh, Webking, and can you hear me again on uh, the mic here? I uh, got it off mute. 
Um, but the 70% species grading for ash, is that too high? That's a great question. Um, I can tell you, um, playing around with the model, you could take this thing down to about 15%, and uh, the outcome still actually um, is favorable from treatment perspective. The CTLA um, valuation for, for ash, that's one that's been used historically in Wisconsin that we still have. I've got friends in Illinois that suggest uh, well, ash have no value. And I can tell you, if, if um, you're putting no value on ash with a species percentage, I totally agree. Um, trying to retain something with no value does not make sense. Um, I like to make an analogy of a shingle on a house. If you need to re-roof your house and your house has no value, you don't re-roof it. But if your house has value, you do re-roof it. In this aspect, would an ash tree that's living uh, have value? Oh, definitely. And so from that aspect, um, you're spending money to retain something that you're putting value in. And so the 70% rating, uh, um, it's something that I'm comfortable using here. Okay. Rich, there was, oh, there um, was the one question about the difference between the control and the no EAB options on your chart. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, the difference between the, the controller, and I'm assuming Brian's getting at... Um, the species percentage of mortality. I'll tackle that as one question. Um, the difference is um, within about a dozen years you have um, most all your ash gone if you do nothing versus uh, if you don't have EAB whatever the normal mortality is. Um, getting at the value aspect of the two options um, and, and thinking back to the chart the, the big difference is um, with uh, no EAB, that'd be you can consider your urban forest population the value it have after you your net value after you subtract management costs. Um, with no control, it'd be um, primarily the extra cost of removing trees as they're dying during that um, uh, exponential uh, curve phase. Did that help answer the question, Brian? Thanks, Brian. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Cliff. I just want to, might want to add that, you know, as the ash trees are, are when they, if you wait till the ash trees are dying, you know, removing the, these dying ash trees definitely um, uh, does have added expense in terms of removing these sorts of things. And uh, as you know, when, when these ash trees are alive, they are. Uh, Providing the same benefits uh, that any other uh, live tree uh, would be providing, even though they could be killed by an ash borer if the tree gets Well, does it make sense to treat? Um, th does it make sense to treat uh, trees that are more than uh, that are already infected? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, it's possible to, to actually save a tree that's up to half dead with the endomectin benzoate. Or one that is uh, about 30% to 30% thinning uh, with the emitted filter treatments. Uh, it's, it's biologically possible to do those sorts of things, but but typically, you know, as an arborist, you want to make sure that tree is worth saving uh, after it's uh, you know, uh, it's worth saving before you you, you do that, that that sort of investment. Uh, the question uh, was given about whether or not the comp, uh, David Ruffin uh, uh, does the ask if the new model the new model works with more than 4,000 trees. Uh, it should uh, at this point in time. If it does not, uh, please send me an email. Uh, otherwise, divide your number by 10 uh, so you can see the, 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 the simulations. But I, I do think it's working. Yeah, if I can add on to what Cliff was saying in the EAB simulator model, um, you could use a thousand tree um, increment. You could use whatever you had for your population. Um, we some of the stuff I was showing was our, our campus tree uh, population for number of trees left after 20 years. Um, the curves will be the same regardless of what population you use um, with the models that we have. Yeah. I'll tackle uh, the question from Jolene uh, um, Stinson about the sweet spot for 20% treatment. Uh, did they treat the biggest and best trees? I think they randomly allocated in that study in and uh, Cliff, you can verify that. But um, regardless of how the study was done, I would certainly uh, take care of my best trees first. Um, 
and um, if I had to allocate resources, take care of the best first, and um, and think about the worst trees as the last candidates for a treating. Yeah, I, I, I would echo that. In the model, they, they, they did it randomly. Uh, and another time that they did this, they also treated just the street trees as well. And they found pretty much the same results uh, when they did that. And what they, they chose this 20%. They want to emphasize that was 20%, uh, a different 20% every year. Okay, And the assumption was that the poison would be in those trees for two seasons. So uh, that means that you know operationally, if you have an area that you're under control, if you can if you can treat, you can have poison in 40 percent in treat in uh, the leaves of 40 percent of those trees, whether it be by uh, every other year application with, of half of those with an endocrine benzoate product, or an annual application of a uh, mid appropriate uh, on trees of the appropriate size, uh, you should get the same results. That's that's not true. I think that the neat thing about you've got uh, three different um, studies here, stuff that we did at Stevens Point, Cliff's work and uh, Demacolic's work, that you're getting the same answer that um, retention of ash economically is, even though it costs money, is a highly desirable outcome. Um, so that's encouraging, I guess, from a research perspective that that you um, you come up with an answer, but you're not always quite sure if it's the correct answer because it's one study. Now we've got several different approaches saying the same thing. Uh, John Palmer uh, has a question about ilmectin benzoate. Uh, the answer is, uh, it, 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 according to uh, the research that's been, that's been done so far, the ilmectin benzoate uh, ha has a better shot at saving the highly damaged trees versus the aminopropyl. Okay, so it's the 50% versus the 30%. I'm not recommending that you try and save the tree that's that is apparently half dead, uh, because you know the time that you're determining that it's half dead sometimes. That might you could be treating the following year, more damage could, could, could actually occur. Hey, I'll echo that. A uh, um, good friend of mine, Mark Stennis, I remember a few years ago, this statement stuck in my head. It was about uh, treating uh, oak trees that had oak wilt, is you can't bring back dead wood. Okay, so if a tree is 75% dead, there is chemistries that you could save the tree, but you can't bring back that 75% that's already dead. Um, Steve Nicholson had a question uh, earlier about treating uh, non-seedless varieties of ash so they could regenerate. Interesting idea. I haven't heard of people thinking about doing that. However, I'm an optimist. Uh, I get it from my mom, uh, genetics, and um, from that aspect, I, I think elm, or excuse me, ash will be like elm in American chestnut where it has not been wiped out, but it will change the ecological cohort of that plant where the lifespan would change from something that may be a hundred, a centurion type tree is something that uh, maybe uh, once every two decades dies. And just based on the ecology, that plant seeds out at a young uh, age, especially green ash. And so I don't think it's going to go away, but it, it may change the cohort of that tree. And, uh, and, and current, current work, I guess, that's going on with uh, biological control uh, is trying to see if uh, they can increase the uh, life of these uh, new ash seedlings in the regrowth forest. And, and this is something that will take us several, maybe several years to, to figure out, but I'm an optimist too. And plus also on the neat side, blue ash. Um, there's data that uh, about 70% of the blue ash in, in harm's way of EAB did not die. And so there's something about perhaps the ecology of that plant or the chemistry that it um, does have some resistance perhaps to emerald ash borer. There's a, there's a group in Ohio uh, that is doing some work on uh, the genomics and the proteomics, which is a fancy way of saying, trying to figure out why these these resistant trees are, 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 are surviving. And they're trying to see if they can teach those tricks to uh, new progeny uh, through uh, breeding. John had a question to uh, uh, Brad Bonham's um, uh, comment about parks and preserves that are treating uh, male and female trees. Um, I don't know the exact information, um, but uh, Brad has information and an uh, email that you could go to uh, to get more info.
I'm sorry, it's Enrico Bonello and Dan Hirsch. Uh, I guess the question that, 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 that Brant uh, talked about was, uh, is there a difference between what the municipality is willing to pay when they're spending public dollars versus what a private citizen is? And I think the answer is, is yes, uh, you know, in, uh, probably in a dollar and cents way. Uh, but one of the things that we want to be, be thinking about is that uh, municipalities can benefit uh, by having lower per tree costs by because of the volume of the work that they actually are contracting. Uh, and homeowners have a chance to do that as well if they work together with their neighbors. And I think you might want to tune back to some earlier webinars about neighbors against bad bugs, uh, which might be a way to go about doing this. Yeah, and the, um, I would concur with that. On the economies of scale, anything you can do to reduce the cost even makes uh, retention of ash with the chemistries we have available even more economically justifiable. Or if you can reduce the number of ash you need to treat similar to what Deb McCulloch found with SLAM, uh, it's even more favorable um, with an outcome. And getting to the private residents, I like to often say uh, um, our models, or my model, uh, I wouldn't necessarily use it as a decision making. That's one of those, um, in economics, we'd say an irrational decision. That doesn't mean it's a bad decision, but you make a decision sometimes not based best on the economics as much as, as a desire that you may have. And so um, it may be uh, economically not justifiable to spend $10 a diameter inch to treat a tree in a public sector. But for a private individual, that makes a lot of sense because the alternative is a uh, no ash tree that they're uh, desiring to retain. Yeah, I, I like to say this uh, in, in, in ways uh, when, when I, um, uh, yesterday I was talking to some folks in, in Terre Haute, and I said if you have an 18 inch diameter ash tree, uh, that takes roughly uh, 36 years to uh, replace a tree that size, okay, uh, if you put it in the start with a one inch DDH tree. And, uh, you know, somebody might ask me, is, is it worth spending uh, the, the 40 to $60 a year uh, for uh, annual treatments uh, to, do it, to do it themselves uh, and, uh, for, for six years? And, and the answer uh, you know, clearly is it's a very personal decision, but uh, most people would, would be happy to have a large tree after spending $240 versus spending maybe two or three times that uh, to have it removed and, and, and replaced. Yeah, the growth rate that uh, Cliff mentioned, that'd be the same outcome here. It'd take about 36 years to get an 18-inch uh, diameter ash tree. So that's uh, an excellent way to actually look at, uh, you know, the time period versus the tree. This is based on uh, a lot of different growth data that people have collected um, um, with uh, urban ash trees in uh, the Midwest. Uh, Steve Nicholson actually makes a great point that, uh, you know, if you're treating a tree that has dead wood, um, if that has a high tree risk, obviously from a safety perspective, removing that, that risk makes a lot of sense. So that would be part of the, the total treatment package there. And uh, Steve points out it could change the economics, actually, of, 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 of that scenario. I would think in a municipal setting you may make the decision that, a tree that's half dead may be a tree that uh, you'd remove from a risk management perspective. Again, that's a decision that you'd, you'd make, but economically it may not pan out. In a private setting, that's a different matter. Well, this has been great information. Um, and a good question and answer session. Uh, Folks, um, why don't we wrap this up? I'm going to give a couple more minutes. Um, we'll have the meeting on, but um, we'll wrap this up at 12.10. How's that sound? And um, I uh, want to thank our presenters today, Rich and Cliff. This was great. I'm, and I hope you all realize that uh, Rich is doing this from Wisconsin and Cliff is doing this from Indiana. So this kind of makes webinars. Uh, we're, we're able to get some really, really good presenters. And... Uh, not have to all drive to different places to, to see them and hear from them. So I appreciate, appreciate everyone's participation. You also notice that uh, Cliff is the master when it comes to uh, audios, and I'm just the rookie learning this out here today. Um, John Palmer had an interesting 
question on uh, the deterioration rate. And I'm assuming that's decay of ash trees after uh, they die. There's anecdotal evidence that these things plop over sooner rather than later. There's a recent paper just came out this past month in Arboriculture Urban Forestry that actually asks that question. And they used some poll testings. And what they discovered was uh, the trees that um, had died in, and I can't remember the time period. I, I want to say probably two years. Um, they had no difference between um, uh, trees that were still living green ash versus those that were dead. The interesting thing they discovered, though, which doesn't surprise me, was ash, as they die, they dry out. You can see that in a firewood pile. And so they did have cracking. And so from that aspect, uh, we know that with sudden limb uh, drop, um, cracks are uh, associated with tree limbs dropping on a windless uh, hot day.